I'm going to be talking about uh, legalization in the United States. And you know, the United States, uh, like, very much like Germany, has a, a federal system where the states have a certain amount of autonomy. But in the United States, um, uh, they're, they're considered two sovereigns. One is the federal and the other is the state. So something can be perfectly okay as far as state authorities are concerned. And then on the other hand, the federal government can uh, quash that. And in the past it has. And we're going to get into <coughs> what's going on now. So let's see. What's, what's, 
What am I doing wrong? Okay. So there's a magazine called Venture, and it's not. I I don't think it has marijuana in the name, but it's uh, it's all about uh, marijuana industry. And I'm going to show you. You know, sometimes the ads are more interesting than the articles. Uh, so here, here are a few of them. This is another one. This is for uh, for soils. So you know, in a lot of I'll get into the different state laws, but in a lot of states they have a plant count, and you know, a plant count is really has no science in it because a plant could be any size when it's flowered out. But if you have a plant count, of course, you want to grow really big plants, right? So you want to nurture the individual plant rather than the field, so to speak. So. Uh, so in this case, they're offering these premium soils now. It might cost two hundred dollars, or three, or let's say, two hundred or three hundred uh, euros to to fill uh, uh, to fill one of these uh, large containers that they use for these giant plants that will yield five kilos or more. But when you think of it on a uh, per gram basis, it's really not not very expensive. So, so soil companies are in a keen competition, and they sell the soil not in bags but in bulk, which is about uh, uh, one to one and a half uh, cubic meters. And uh, here they're advertising, you know, free delivery. Okay, this is. Uh, um, these are different. Uh, displays that you would have at a butt bar. You know, if you're going to have a medical dispensary or any kind of store, you want to have something so that people can look at it. So these are, are dispensaries, uh, uh, products for dispensaries that meet the code. You know, that like, they might look a lot like a, a salt or uh, maybe a, a salt shaker so that you can smell it. And on the other side, it might have a magnifying glass so you can Get it up close, but you can't touch it. Smell, don't touch. So, uh, and uh, so the, you can have samples on the counter like that. So it can't be pilfered. You know, the uh, the sample itself isn't being contaminated. Here, uh, insurance. Well, if you go into a business, you need business insurance, right? I mean, isn't this a dream? I mean, the thing is, it's a pinch me dream. I've been waiting for this for a long time. Okay, now, the dream happened before to me because I was in Switzerland uh, in 1999 and 2000, and I was employed in a 30, you know, uh, like a 15 hectare farm. And uh, it, it had a number of different fields. It, it wasn't one contiguous piece of land, so the, there were different fields. But this is one field. And the reason why I bring this up is this is how I think that marijuana is going to be grown in, in part. So on this farm, uh, there were a number of greenhouses. There were both these uh, hoop-type greenhouses and uh, uh, like the, uh, standard glass greenhouses. And, uh, and they, those greenhouses produced a steady flow of small plants that were ready to go and be planted outside. So there were three crops a year. And the way there were three crops a year is that the first crop went out in, in April, in, in uh, late April. And those were plants that were large enough to immediately go into flower. And you know that some varieties, when they go into flower, they stop growing. And other varieties continue to grow. So they took varieties that would continue to grow a little. And then uh, they started shading them. With, and if you notice, uh, you can't really see it, but 
there are, there are two kinds of covers there. There's a clear plastic cover and a black plastic cover. And the clear plastic cover was put over when there was a rain or inclement weather. And the, the black plastic cover was put over daily to flower the plants. And then those plants would be ready in June and the next crop would go. So I want you to notice how, uh, how uh, close together the plants are and how small they are. And then I want you to think about light. So, you know, once light hits something opaque, like for instance, a leaf, uh, that light no longer exists. The leaf underneath it, that it's in, it, it's in its shadow, is getting virtually no usable light except for maybe some ambient light. So if you grow a tall plant, but you'll notice, or let's say if you grow a wide plant, if it, you'll notice that if you look inside the plant, the inside of the plant is hollow. So it's not as if the whole plant you know, is solid thick with buds. It's just the outside, and the inside looks like a skeletal structure supporting the, you know, the, the buds that are on the outside of it. So basically what I'm saying is, you, any light, all the light, if all the light is hitting the top of the plants and not going inside, then all that inside growth and all of that tall growth and all of that growth, it's all for naught. It's wasted growth, wasted fertilizer, wasted water, wasted time. Instead, these plants were grown very close together and because they were grown in parallel rather than in series. So each plant only had to grow a little bit. Boom, ready to flower. And then they flower. Now, that's opposed to growing very large plants, which is by fiat, by law. That does it, but if, if people, if, the, if it was truly a free market and people could grow the way they wanted to grow, this would be the way their farmers would grow it. You don't hear farmers talking about, oh, you should see how big my wheat plants are. They talk about what the yield is in, in the field, and that's what we're talking about. And since you're not growing hemp, you're not looking for you know tremendous branch growth. You really want who, who's for branch growth and who's for buds? Let's take buds first. All the branch people can leave. <laughs> Okay, so I'll oh, we do that. So, you know, Switzerland, it was really amazing. They, when I was there, I was there for two summers, and they said, somebody said to me, you know, you know how many police we have in uh, Switzerland? They said, uh, three, and I said, I don't know, he said three million. One half watches the other half. And you see this field, and it's right by that housing there, and nobody would think of going into the field, right? That's pretty cool, right? <laughs> I mean, I mean, people could just walk into that field there. There's, there you see all the guards in there, and guard towers? Oh, no, you don't see them? You don't see them? No? So, I mean, people could just walk into that field, but uh, they were very, very honest. Now, uh, so this is another picture of it. Uh, here you see the clear plastic, as well as the black plastic, that clear plastic I was talking about. This is a uh, breeder, Steve, he dropped out of, he couldn't take the rough and tough of marijuana breeding, so he's breeding grapes instead. And uh, so, uh, but this was in the greenhouse where we cut clones from. Now, this is an interesting story, you know, where Switzerland and the war was going on in the former Yugoslavia. So all these refugees were moving into, into uh, Switzerland. And Switzerland had a very tolerant policy that they could all move in oh, and everything, but they couldn't work. So you're a refugee, you just left everything, and you can't work. Thanks a lot for letting us live here. We'll just starve to death. 
Right? So he hired all these people. And in the US, he, we would say, we got a green card. You know, they're not. They're, but in this case, they were legally there, but they weren't legally allowed to work. They could just beg for food or something, for food and shelter. And you know that Switzerland, you know, it, it's an inexpensive country to live in. Everybody knows that, right? Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, so you couldn't get Swiss people to work in the fields. And this was field work and hand work. And so he hired all these different Yugoslav women from all the different fighting areas. And all the women got along really well. And he didn't hire any of the men. And that was, the men came to pick the women up who were working. And also, that must have changed the family structure a little because the women that were the, were the breadwinners. So this is a picture. I gathered the prettiest women in the air, in the thing to get it in this picture. This is it. So, so hard life. Well, isn't this a great picture? <laughs> Well, you know what, I have to tell you, I'm really sorry, but a major portion of the, uh, the major portion of the legalization PowerPoint isn't here. So I'm going to just talk about it. So there are 50 states. There are 20 states that either have decriminalization, uh, uh, some sort of medical use, and or legalization. And there's only one state that has anything with a semblance of legalization, and that's Colorado. And the thing about Washington is that they tout it as a legalization bill, but the only thing that's legal there is 28, up to 28 grams. 29 grams is a mis misdemeanor, so is 40 grams is a felony, so is um, uh, cultivation and transfer and everything else, except if you're licensed to do it. So the only people who can grow there, or the only companies that can grow there are these licensed companies. And then they have these taxes that double the price of, of weed there. So, so the people are paying up to about 700, 700 euros a, a, a gram, I mean a, a, for a 28 grams pretty expensive, I think. So, while on the black market they can get it for less than half that. And that's the thing, that a market like that promotes a robust black market, and then you're into cops and robbers again, and the cops can come in because they don't have civil regulation. Now, in, in other states like Colorado, they have uh, there's a very thorough uh, monitoring, but it's obviously not impossible because marijuana and the marijuana industry is thriving there. State by state, things are changing. In Nevada, I was at a, a hearing in, for La, Las Vegas uh, Zoning Commission where 20 percent, uh, where uh, uh, 100 um, a hundred different dispensaries were given a total of about 18 to 18 or 20 hectares of land to, to not land, but 
indoor cultivation. Can you imagine that electric bill? So that brings me to the next thing. You know, I said that that uh, this is the future. I didn't necessarily mean that a low-tech system like the ones that we saw were the future, but first of all, I don't believe lights are the future. Not in terms of in the entire photo, not in, not in terms of the, being the main source of photosynthesis, because you just can't compete with the sun. And I think that greenhouses are, are the way to go. And, you know, greenhouses don't have to run 12 months of the year. So there can be some seasonal greenhouses, and there can be permanent greenhouses. There can be operations like this. But the more medical you want to get, the more medical you get, the more closed system that you want to get. Because in a closed system where the air is recirculated and clean, and there are no contaminants coming in, into the room, no pests, no insects, no, uh, the fungi are controlled. I think that that kind of system, in a, with, even within a greenhouse structure, is very is more viable than a closed than than a uh, than a system that's primarily lit by uh, by uh, electric power. And I want you to think of this too. You know, uh, you have much better weather, I think, than how, looking at what I saw. You have better, better better weather in terms of sunlight than Holland does. And Holland is their greenhouse industry uh, is uh, uh, about eight, uh, hundred. Um, 75 square kilometers. I mean, it's, it's really, really quite large. So, I think that it can be, and you know, there are a lot of greenhouses here in Austria, and there is no reason why it shouldn't be done here. Now, the other thing that I wanted to talk about was automation. So, You know, every, everything that, that we do, uh, it, well, in the United States, almost every greenhouse that I've been to has not been automated. And um, very often what a grower will do when they're asked to, to go into a greenhouse situation is they'll go with what they know and they'll make the green, partition the greenhouse which functions on an economy of scale, they'll move it over into, uh, th they'll take that greenhouse and they'll uh, br break it up so that they have these different environments and so on. And uh, uh, they, so that they can't get the automation. So the reason why I bring this up is all of the, but they're beginning to bring that in. And with that automation, there has to be a tremendous investment. So that now we go back to legalization and what that means to legalization. So as long as there were only hippies to bust, it was one thing. You know, okay, so more traffic for the police. But now people are putting in investments and states are, are seeing how much m money there is in this. And there's a lot of pressure on the federal government. And that pressure, is, well, it resulted in the federal government saying it would lay off Colorado and, uh, and the state of Washington. But it's happening all over. The state of Nevada, as I said, is giving out permits. And to apply for the permit costs hundreds of thousands of euros. And then if, if they're putting together, right now they're putting together clothes, uh, uh, electrically lit uh, grow rooms. So if you're putting together a, a, a grow room of several hectares, you can imagine how much that costs. It, it costs more than a million dollars. Well, about seven, 700,000, 700 to 800,000 euros per acre per, well, Okay, so it costs about two million dollars, two million euros per hectare. 
to put something like that together, maybe more in Europe than in the United States, because a lot of the equipment is less expensive there. So these are substantial investments. And so the states are looking for some sort of security. And that, that's put the federal government in quite a bind, because they, can no, they no longer have the cooperation of the state governments in the war, in that sector of the war on drugs. It's, it's out of their hands. But then there's the other part of the problem, which is that some of the state, this is on a state by state basis, so a person can be perfectly legal in one state and have a major felony in another state. That isn't going to be solved right away. But I think what is going to happen is that with the next elections, or very soon, the state governments are going to be putting even more pressure on the federal government because they want the tax revenues. And it's not just the, you know, that it's not just the direct tax revenues, but all the indirect, the, all the industry it creates. You know, it's, you know, I, I showed some of, some of that advertising. But, the, you know, it's everything from, you know, anything that you might use in either farming or in, in nursery management. So it's been a boon to, to all kinds of industries. And uh, look, look, at, look at marijuana on the internet. Look how many people are just employed in the internet, in uh, 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 different sites and different, uh, uh, di different sites and different programs on the internet. And it runs in the hundreds of thousands of people that are just involved in that. So there are so many uh, ancillary industries the plastic container industry. I, I saw this ad for a fast food company and it was like this guy jumping up and down and he was jumping up and down because he had just gotten the fork contract for the salads that the company was now going to be producing. And, you know, it's, it's like that. There are all these ancillary things and this is putting a lot of pressure on. So now I want to get to a few, few states that are so Oregon, the state of Washington, I mean the city of Washington, D.C., uh, uh, the Virgin Islands, and several other, uh, two other states are uh, uh, going to have either uh, decriminalization, uh, legalization, or medical use laws uh, passed by initiative this November. And then in 2016, there will be quite a number of states that have, that have the initiative process that are going to have initiatives. And I can talk a little bit about the California initiative. Well, you know that when you put 10, uh, ten potheads in a room, you, you can have a discussion and come out with a uni unified consensus on something, right? Uh, you, you don't, you, know, you haven't had that experience? Well, I would not say that the, mar that the uh, marijuana, uh, the, the run for the marijuana initiative is uh, that, that it's beyond the egos. And that there are a lot, lot of egos involved that might uh, actually hold fairly uh, similar positions, but, the, you know, it's people who <coughs> want to be the kingpin of it. And my analysis of it is that it's going to be, go to the people or the group that has been able to raise a large sum of money, large sums of money by, contributed by major donors. Because it, you're just not going to do, you know, the, old, the idea in the United States, well, if every, if every stoner just gave $10, you know, we'd have such a big fund, we'd be able to take over the Congress. And you know, that's probably true, but, or maybe $100. But, but that's probably true, but, but they're not gonna do it. So instead, the hope is, and, and what's happening,
happened in the last initiatives, and I, I'll talk a little bit about the first one, which was in California. What, what, what happens is that you go to large donors. Well, there's, a, there, there's this hippie that was very successful in business in 19, and well, let me start that uh, there was this activist, Dennis Perot, and in 1994 he uh, put an, an initiative through for the city of San Francisco that said that the police should give marijuana lowest priority. And then he said, you know, all my friends are dying of AIDS, so I'm going to do an initiative. So he opened up a dispensary illegally, and with the money from that dispensary, he thought that he would be able to run this initiative in California. But he, his dispensary was busted, and he was sort of out of the picture, but his initiative had already gathered a certain amount of signatures, and there was a question of whether it should be go continue going. And I, um, I was chairman in Alameda County, and I continued to have people collect signatures, and they were paid for by various collections that I had, had made. But so what happened was, as soon as we made the, as soon as we, uh, uh, there were, but there were, so there was this uh, business person who had been very, who was a hippie who had been very successful beyond his dreams and had hundreds of millions of dollars. And he contributed $250,000 and he challenged other rich friends that he had to meet it. And they called up and they said, well, are they still collecting signatures? I said, well, right in my county, they, uh, we, we got so many this week, was the only county collected, but nevertheless. Uh, and then he called me up and he said, you know, why should they contribute this time rather than next time when we'll have a much better initiative. And I came back with that there is, would be an inflation of opposition because this time the police and the justice system didn't realize that the numbers, the polling numbers were real. They thought those polling numbers were fake, that they were getting the polling numbers that they were getting and they didn't trust the polling numbers. So we didn't have much opposition. So I said that and he, this, uh, the head of the DPA went back to the funders and they funded it. It wouldn't have happened without the multi-million, loose association of millionaires and billionaires. That's what it was and that's what funded it. So, so that's what I was getting to. And then we had to go back again and the, the answer when they said, well, we need more money. Well, you say, well, you're a business person, so what if you um, would you let's say you're, you're starting a new operation and it's doing well it's just that it needs more money than you thought would you close it down would you lose all the money no you put a little more money in so the force opened up again so what that taught me here and the relevance to today is in all these initiatives it's who puts up the money as to which initiative it gets on the ballot. And uh, uh, so there's a big scramble now. There's a big scramble now as to who's going to connect, you know, who's going to collect the money. And uh, there's a, there are all kinds of rumors about who, who's got money from whom, who will work with whom. Then the new part of the equation is, you know, I showed you those stocks. And in every one of those stocks, people became millionaires or multi-millionaires, often for hopes. You know, what can I tell you? But anyway, so these million, these, uh, this is new part of the equation because there was never any money from growers for legalization, and no, never any money from the head shop industry for. It. Or from the par, or from, uh, or from the uh, the, the uh, grow store industry, or any of those. All those people. Oh no, we're not associated with marijuana. But these people are associated with marijuana, and they have millions of dollars. 
So for some of them, it's a dream to be the, the king of marijuana, you know, to, to get it past the finish line. So there's going to be a terrible scramble as to what's going to be the issue. But I want to give you a few things that I think should be an attempt of an, any initiative. And I, I'm, <coughs> excuse me, I'm not only talking about the United States, but I'm talking all over the world. Well, the first thing is that all people should have the right to use marijuana. I mean, these are very basic things. I know the, 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 the devil is in the details, but all people should be allowed to use marijuana. It's very simple. Then everybody should be allowed to grow their own and share it with their friends and their families. Simple. Okay. There should be a medical track for marijuana, and that's separate from the adult use track. And the reason why I say that is you know, as these dispensaries have had competition and matured over the years, there are no regulations on them. But they all do testing for infections like E. coli, salmonella. They all do THC, CBD, CBN, and now most of them are doing terpene testing. So, uh, so there should, but and the the products that are coming out, many of the products, you know. Everybody says, okay, so everybody. So like, what the first prescription I got for medical was uh, that, um, well, the second one said, the first one said I should never be without it. The second one said mocking and disruptive behavior. And he didn't, the, the uh, uh, doctor didn't say, uh, whether it exacerbated it or controlled it, exactly. But, um, but on the other hand, the dispensaries have very serious medicines that are geared for specific medical conditions. Oh, I, you know, the reason I originally used it was because I had latent glaucoma, but I stopped using it for that, for my latent glaucoma, which, you know, wasn't detectable because I was using it. But I stopped using it for that, and now I'm using it so that uh, my wife doesn't have to take Prozac. <laughs> Total medical use. So, so, we, uh, but uh, you know, there's a serious side to medical, and. And so many people are getting help from different varieties of marijuana and different concoctions for marijuana, and especially in, in California, where you know there are very few regulations, so all of these companies can experiment with new medicines and not be violating some sort of code or law. And so it's brought. So I think that that medical track is going to continue, and there's going to be overlap between the product that's in the medical dispensaries and in the adult use. So there'll be some products that will be in both, but there'll be some that will be found only in one or the other. And that's why I say a separate medical track. And I say that there should be an adult use track. This is, we're got getting back to it, and that is that it depends on the country, but. Let's say in California, uh, cities and counties can have an initiative. So rather than having city councils or some county uh, uh, legislators decide on it, I say that, yeah, they can ban adult use stores, but it has to be a vote of the people. It can't be these representatives. So that's. That would be my solution for California. But uh, I think that counties and cities shouldn't be allowed to, um, uh, to stop manufacturing or processing. And states, uh, you know, uh, this is in California. They, so, so that even if you can't sell it there, you can process it. And one of the things about I, I see a tax system where it's a tiered tax system where there's uh, a gross receipts tax 
on several, as it goes through uh, growing to processing to retail sales. So that means if there's a tax at each of those, the county where it's grown, they, they get part of the tax money. But if it was, everything was at the end, then all these different areas where there was marijuana involved, that were involved with the marijuana, they wouldn't, uh, they would not be able to uh, share in those tax revenues. And then a couple of other things is that uh, uh, people, uh, the most important thing about an initiative is that it's winnable. So I know that people would like to put a lot of different pet issues on it, like the GE issue or the organic issue or other issues like that. But I think anything that, like if we had the GE issue, the genetic engineering, then Monsanto would come in to defeat it. Then they'd spend any amount of money to do it just for that. So you don't want it, you want to keep it as clear and as clean as possible. And as far as California goes, virtually all of the people who are in prison in California for marijuana are in for, <clears throat> for the United States relatively short terms. <clears throat> Most of the max would be about three, three and a half years. So they'll be termed out. If we put free all the convicts, you know, all the convicted people, it, we lose. We probably lose lose the initiative. So it has to be realistic. Now, in other states, the legislatures have grabbed on to the profitability of marijuana and have limited the number of facilities or or they're selling stuff to the highest bidder. You know, all of these things. The higher they bring the price between the between the black market and the and uh, the, the official market, and the bigger the difference in price, the more of the, more of the chronic u lose, users that they will lose. So that means they might be getting these revenues that they never got before, but they'll always be losing revenues. Oh, another thing is, you know, I don't know about in, in Austria, or I do know a little bit about Holland, <coughs> and, but in both Holland and the United States, the police seem to have be so confused about the marijuana laws that they just can't <coughs> learn what the laws are and they can't get them right. And it's what can they do when they make a mistake? And I say, you know what? I don't want to challenge them that way. I think that it must be very frustrating that in all these years they haven't been able to learn it. I mean, Imagine, like, if you were trying to, I don't know, grow a plant, and all and year after year you failed. I mean, it would be really frustrating. So it must be really frustrating to the police and the criminal system that they can't learn exactly what the laws are. And so I thought, well, maybe they shouldn't have to. So we'll just take them out of the laws, and instead of criminal justice, it will be civilly regulated, just like any other business product like you've seen here, right? And if it's civilly regulated, that means if the police say, you say, we don't want any, we gave last year. <laughs> now they have that in Colorado. And that's what, you know, they have a lot of restrictive things in Colorado, but it's civilly regulated, and that makes all the difference. So here's what the difference that makes. Let's say under some law you're allowed to grow 10 plants, and it turns out that you're growing 11 plants. Well, then that's a criminal act under, if, it's, if it's under criminal law. And if it's under civil law, probably the inspector would say, you know, you have to tear down one of these plants. Or probably he'd say one, three, two. <laughs> you only have nine here. <laughs> or, or maybe the inspector would say, I'm giving you a ticket. You know, 
which is a fine and which is not criminal. It's like a traffic fine or a parking ticket or something like that. And that makes all the difference, you know? It just makes all the difference that you don't have the fear of jackbooted thugs knocking down your door. And uh, if you don't believe that that could happen, uh, you could go on to YouTube and, or Google, well, just Google, but you could go on to YouTube and go, Columbia, Missouri SWAT raid. And this was before, you know, they gunned down those two black kids in, uh, in uh, Missouri. And this was before, and th these people were lucky they were white. So they only killed their dogs as they came in. It's a very graphic uh, video. And the, police, the reason there is this video is the police filmed this as uh, to show, you know, to do, it was sort of like a model raid. And the raid was to deliver a, uh, a summons for pop. So, uh, and I, I think that any group of police, you know, it's like, Individually, they might be nice people, when you, but when that whole gang gets together, I don't know, something happens to them. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, people in Holland used to think that that would never, it can't happen here because, you know, all the experience that the Dutch people had with the Nazis and all that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the first time the police come, they say, oh, we're really sorry. And then the second time they say, okay, off to jail. You know, and I mean, you know, it's sharks and blood. So, so we have to take the police and the criminal justice system out of it, totally out of it. So they have no incentive to try to influence the laws. Because who are the main ones trying to influence these laws? They're not the, the pharmaceutical companies or all of that, because you know what? One, once it, once these, these um, I'll say informal, you know, informal research companies hit something good, the pharmaceutical companies will just pick it up anyway. They don't care. They're going to be part of it one way or another. You know, they'll buy it, they'll make it, they'll steal it. You know. So they and when I go to the science conferences, it used to be all sponsored by. Uh, government agencies, DEA and IMH and things, but but now it's a lot of it is the uh, pharmaceutical companies. So I don't think they're part of that. I think it's mainly the criminal justice system that is fighting this because they know that once it gets real, they're not going to be part of it, and we're going to help them with that realization. And that's one of the main things that's so important in the California initiative because it's going to be a template for the rest of the nation and that, and maybe the rest of the world is to get the cops out of it, just out of it, and have it civilly regulated the way either driver's licenses or alcohol or whatever. And you know, let's say you drink alcohol and you go to bars and you never get into fights and you're not driving home. You have no intersection with the police, right? There's no intersection there. It's civil. You're not doing anything wrong, you know, right? That and that is the same thing with marijuana. Now I'm not talking about the driving thing and all that, but what I am talking about that there is no reason, in terms of the police, being part of it, and and civil regulation is the way to go. And it's much much cheaper. And the other thing about civil regulation is that um, that you know the war on drugs started in 1937 before any of us were born. But and in the United States, that, I mean, it started before then, but it became federal in 1937. And you know, I want to tell you how well it's done. So in 1937, there were estimated to be 50,000 marijuana users in the United States. And now they're estimated to be, I said 50,000, right? And now they're estimated to be about 60 million. 
which is a 15,000% increase. So, and I figure if, the merit, if it continues, sometime in the next 15 years, there will actually be more marijuana users in the United States than there will be people, if it goes on that rate. <laughs> First, I was puzzled by it, but now I know what it is. It's the canaries. They're gonna feed it to the, the, to the pets. They're gonna give all the pets pot. I've had experience with that. Yes, I had, this is true. I had a pet cat, her name was Rosie, and she got feline AIDS. And I wanted to feed her marijuana, but I couldn't do that because, you know, it was illegal. So I went to a vet to try to get a license for her to use it. And it wasn't in the law. He couldn't give her a license. Why could I do it? I'm not going to answer that because <laughs> you know, if it was only kids, that would be easy, but it might be Animal Protective Services coming. <laughs> So, uh, what we're going to see in the United States, so, is this continuing conflict for another few years between the federal government and the states. But meanwhile, this, the federal government's efforts are going to be checkmated because the states are going to say, what? Hey, listen, we have real businesses here, and this is too much. You can't disrupt like this. We're tired of this stuff. So the government is going, the federal feds are going to have to make accommodations state by state. And that's, that's what I think. Listen, I can take a few minutes of questions if there are any questions. Yes? It's still pretty messed up in Oakland, yeah? I'm from Oakland. And I've been stopped several times. The feds come to my house and they leave everything and then the cops come to my house or vice versa, the cops come to my house and then they leave everything and then the feds come to my house. Well, you know what, Here, here's the thing, the ex it, it's so true, the experience, you know, which is something that the two of us know, the experience, I live in Oakland also, yeah, yeah. yeah. so the, the experience that I have in Oakland is a different experience than you have, partly because of neighborhood, you know, because of the demographics of the neighborhood, yeah. and partly just like DWB, you know, driving while black, yeah. right, and uh, you know what, uh, uh, when I've been with black friends, I don't know how many times we've been stopped because especially when a white and a black guy are hanging out together, it must be drugs, right? Yeah, totally. Always. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, but, and that, and, but this, taking it out of the cops, stops it. Yeah. You know, it's not teaching the cops, it's nothing like that. You're not part of it anymore. Sorry, you couldn't learn about it, yeah. you know, yeah. and, and also, you know, uh, the cops, a lot of them, they don't believe that marijuana is medical until they need it. Because you have all these retired cops on disability talking about how good marijuana is. And, you know, meanwhile, that how many hundreds of lives sometimes did they ruin? Yeah, so. so anyway, those are the major things, those are the major parts, but you know, but it's right, and it's, um, it is, yeah. Every, everything that they talk about the racism in the United States, it's not exaggerated, just isn't, in, in every area of life. Yeah. What about driving under influence? How, how should they oversee that? Well, you know, the, there have been tests on that, and there was recently a test. I, I saw it on uh, I, I saw it on the internet. I just can't tell you where it is, but but it, it was done recently, and they had uh, uh, people who are inspectors for the drive for uh, uh, drivers' licenses. You know who the the examiners. And they had them uh, start with people with different amounts, uh, different sophistication of using it. And they had them drive this course over several times as they got more and more stoned. And 
like uh, there was a little bit of a deterioration, but at some point, but at all, but that deterioration was not enough for this person, to, for the inspector to stop them. He said, I wouldn't have stopped them for, for that. So then it got to a point where people said, you know, I'll do this, but I wouldn't drive like this. And that's where, you know, you saw more serious things. But that's the difference between marijuana and alcohol, because the alcoholics, the alcohol, the person using alcohol and the way alcohol affects the mind, it says, gives them confidence that they can do it. You know, sort of uh, like the wolf of Wall Street. He drives it, and in his mind, he's driven home perfectly safe, and when he gets, sees it the next day, the car's a wreck. <laughs> the police are there for it. So, uh, <coughs> So I, I, I don't, you know, here's the other part of that. Like, you know, in Austria, you've had a 30-year uh, test run on marijuana. Where are all the drive, where are all the accidents? I mean, people have been using it, right? Right? Nobody's been using it in Austria? They use it. No? Oh, I forgot. But, I mean, where are all the accidents? You know, where are all the cancers? Where are all the heart attacks? Where, you know, all this stuff about how bad marijuana is and it's gonna just ruin us. And I, I do think Simon and I know each other, he will tell you, you know, like my drive has just been totally zapped by it all these years, right, Simon? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> His too? So, I mean, the reality hits the fan. Where is it? I mean, and so all this stuff about driving, it just doesn't exist. You don't see, you know, the only time you see marijuana, or virtually the only time that you see marijuana involved with uh, accidents is when alcohol is also involved in that. And, and that's statistically there. Or other drugs mixed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're mixed together, yeah. Any other questions? And my question was, if, you know, the family, uh, Stanley Brothers? The what? The family, Stanley Brothers? Mm. Stanley, that's like Colorado uh, family. Yeah. And they have their own strain, it's called uh, Charlotte Webb. Yeah. That's a CBD bomb. Yeah, yeah uh, well, I, yeah. My question was, uh, you know, about it, is it now under uh, zero point, Seven percent. Then in Austria, is it uh, with the THC? Is it legal or zero point yeah. three? Yeah. And the TV, uh, TV is not a real big deal. Yeah, I, I understand. You know, in order to qualify under the hemp laws, it has to be under point three percent THC. That's what you're referring to. <laughs> and so, uh, I I really don't know. I can't speak to Charlotte's web, but I can speak that there, there are other varieties that are, you know, that are under 3.3% uh, th uh, THC. For real? And For real, yeah. And <laughs> Excuse me? The name of the different I, I don't know, but you know, uh, if you, even he here, the, is the CBD crew here? No, but but the seed companies here. Some of the seed companies offer very high CBD strains. So, and if you don't see that, you can look on the internet. I mean, it, there's ample uh, places where you can buy it. And my next question, my next question was: Is it legal to sell some clones in the California state for me at all? At all, three people. Well, if you became a resident of California, and that would, and, you know, like, let's say you got a driver's license, opened up a bank account, then you would be qualified as a resident, and you would be able to get a, a recommendation. And if I were a doctor, I would, look, open up your eyes a little. <laughs> yeah, you look very ill. I would give you a recommendation. <laughs> Yeah.